system. Okay. Yes, sir. It is it is your floor now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you so much um, for the introduction and sorry about the technical difficulties. So my name is Atreya Manaswi. Uh, I'm so happy to be joined by you all uh, on Zoom tonight. And I'm a 10th grade student, going to be an 11th grade student this coming fall uh, at Orlando Science High School in Orlando, Florida. And I'm going to be speaking to you all today on small hive beetle biology and control, uh, sharing some background and also some of my research specifically using natural attractants. And I've been working with the United States Department of Agriculture um, in Gainesville and also UF. So before I get into my actual research, I want to just take a minute to share my backstory of how I really got into beekeeping at a young age. So nearly five years ago, I went on a short fishing trip with a friend and his grandfather, who was a beekeeper. And while we were on the boat, uh, my friend's grandfather began describing the significant declines in his beekeeping practices and how decades ago he would collect dozens of barrels of honey, but how that season he'd gotten merely three. So this was really shocking to me, and to this day, I remember the distinct tone of his voice. And ever since then, um, I went back home that day and dug into the research and statistics and did some brainstorming and eventually made my way into the laboratory doing my first research project and then progressing into field trials, which was a stark contrast for me. So um, I'm going to be speaking twofold about two things. Uh, the first is the biology of the beetle, focusing on the background, morphological, and behavioral characteristics, and then the treatment in regards to my research uh, with chemical-based agents and then also organic-based treatments. So the takeaways uh, I'd like you to get from this PowerPoint by the end are, firstly, what small hive beetles are, if you didn't already know. Uh, secondly, what these beetles actually do inside your colonies. Third, what I learned from my research. And then fourth, how you can apply my findings in your commercial or hobbyist practices. So uh, let's dive into it with the biology of the beetle. And so the scientific name for this beetle is Athena tomita, and they were actually native to sub-Saharan Africa prior to the 1990s. However, in 1996, we saw the first report from the Carolinas, and then in 1998, the uh, first actual infestation was reported uh, from our home state, Florida. And ever since then, these beetles have been spreading all across the globe, wreaking significant negative impacts on the industry. And as you may know, in the States, we have a very large migratory beekeeping operation with like two thirds um, of, our, of our hives going to California each year for pollination of almonds and other crops. So it's almost like a breeding ground and a frenzy for these different pests. Now, these beetles are described as opportunistic scavengers in the literature and what they do inside the hive is consume the honey and the pollen stores, damage the cappings, the comb, and also um, feed on small brood. And so the main detriment with these beetles is their defecation within the colony. The larvae of the beetle specifically defecate everywhere in the hive. And this is a big, big problem. So you can actually sex these beetles. And I did this in some of my uh, laboratory assays. You take the abdomen of the beetle and then you squeeze and one of three things can happen. Either a very short appendage shoots out, a very long appendage shoots out, uh, or the beetle explodes. And that did happen to me as well. Uh, you might assume that this long appendage um, it indicates that it's a male, but this is actually an ovipositor. So this long appendage is like an egg laying machine gun. The, uh, the female small hive beetle is able to take that ovipositor, which is what it's called, and insert it into cracks and crevices inside the hive and deposit her eggs. And the uh, short appendage here is a phallus uh, of the male. And if nothing uh, pokes out, it's generally uh, like rule of thumb that it's a male. Now there's other beetles that do show up inside the colony. Here on the left, we have a sap beetle and a pollen beetle. So I, I show these to illustrate that just because other beetles show up in your colonies doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it is a small hive beetle. The best thing to do is call your local bee inspector um, or to just look uh, visually and see what the differences are. So on the right here, we have an instance of a large hive beetle. And this is actually a beetle native to uh, Africa. 
And so large hive beetles don't belong to a specific species. It just describes a class of different beetles. But uh, small hive beetles refer to Athena tamida. Now, these are called large hive beetles given their size. Uh, 20 to 23 millimeters, uh, this species specifically, that's the measurement. And small hive beetles are four to six millimeters in length, so much, much smaller. Now, there are four primary stages in the life cycle of these small hive beetles. The first stage is the egg stage, which takes two to four days uh, for these eggs to emerge as larvae. These larvae on the top right uh, feed for seven to 10 days inside the colony, and then they develop um, into pupae. So these larvae, once full, um, they feed on the honey and the pollen, and they do most of the damage. They will exit the colony and then pupate in the soil within the vicinity of the hive. And so these pupae take three to six weeks to develop, and then they emerge as adults and develop this reddish brown hue in 24 to 48 hours. Now, what's important to note here uh, is these, these days. So two days plus seven days plus about three weeks, given that's given optimal conditions. So that's a, two plus seven is about a week. And then plus this third week is about four weeks. And the treatment or the lifespan of this beetle is 24 weeks. So four times six is 24, meaning that given optimal environmental conditions, we can see up to six consecutive generations of this beetle inside the hive. Uh, at a given time, which really goes to show that these infestations can get out of control if they're not managed very, very quickly as well. Shaking our heads in horror. <laughs> so uh, the larvae, as I mentioned earlier, are the root cause for this damage. Uh, on the bottom, in the middle, you can see an image of what these larvae actually do. They appear very suddenly and in large numbers, often in the hundreds or the thousands. And there's this yeast intimately associated with the feces of the small hive beetle called Cotyma omeri on the bottom left. And Cotyma omeri causes the fermentation of the sugars within pollen and honey. And this fermentation releases a volatile odor compound called isoamyl acetate. And isoamyl acetate is a honeybee alarm pheromone. Once isoamyl acetate is released from the hive, it serves as a calling signal essentially to other beetles in the vicinity of the hive. And so um, once this event occurs, these larvae appear very suddenly and start defecating, this ter it's termed as a slime out. Um, and there's really two telltale signs of a sufficiently bad larval infestation. The first thing is that when you pop up in the lid on a super, you'll smell a distinct rotting citrusy odor. And the second thing is honey will begin to bleed out from the front of the colony, as you can see in the right. Now, some interesting behavioral characteristics with this beetle. Um, the first thing I'd like to note is uh, a jailing phenomenon. That's not a technical term, um, but the bees will actually corner these beetles into cracks and crevices in the hive and then essentially jail them. So we'll, you'll have guard bees and they'll make sure that the beetles stay in that spot within the hive so that they can't uh, wander off and reproduce. Another interesting phenomena is that uh, on the bottom right, these beetles will take their antenna and actually antenate or vibrate their antenna against the mandibles of the honeybee, tricking the honeybee into thinking that the beetle is actually a bee. And so the honeybee will regurgitate food and start feeding the beetle. So you can just imagine how opportunistic and smart of a pest these really are. Another thing, um, which is a recent finding, I believe in like 2019 or 2020, it may have come out of the UFB lab, um, was a study that found that these beetles actually act as a vector for a few different diseases and viruses. I think it was three of them, and among them was deformed wing virus. Um, so they, they are shown to be a vector for disease transmission as well. Now... A comparison uh, between the wax moth larvae and the small hive beetle larvae is what this is. So on the top, we see the wax moth larvae, which is much larger in its size. Um, it's about twice as long and a four times as large in its width. There are very long hairs all over its body. It has much less uh, pronounced abdominal segmentation as compared to the small hive beetle larvae on the bottom. And in addition to that, it has six pro legs near the head and then uh four legs um, near the back, or ra rather uh, eight legs here near the back. These are the pro legs, and then there's six uh, legs near the head. So um, I, I illustrate this because 
it can be confusing looking at these uh, just at first glance and thinking that they're the same thing. Obviously, the biggest characteristic that defines these two is that these wax moth larvae have webbing and cocooning with inside uh, the hive, and then these small hive beetle larvae have the defecation and that slimy uh, situation. So some good general practices for uh, apiary management of these beetles is that when combining or exchanging comb to be careful because you can actually introduce small hive beetle eggs from outside the colonies. Uh, in addition, when removing old frames or adding uh, old frames into new hives, it's important to make sure that these aren't raw and cracked or damaged comb because uh, dilapidated frames or comb can make for very good reproductive sites or hiding spots for these beetles. And when pulling honey from the colonies, it's very important to extract as fast as possible. Um, I've known beekeepers who've lost their entire stores uh, just to defecation of these beetles by not extracting in time. Um, the beetles consume the wax cappings and then start defecating inside these combs. And so what you could do is freeze your honey. Um, that would definitely slow that down and kill these beetles. You can also expose your hives to more sunlight. So the hive beetles are repelled by the sun uh, as they heat up and the bees don't mind as much. They will get a bit more aggressive. So you will have to be uh, careful when handling them. And when creating nukes or even adding new frames uh, or new supers, it's very important to only add as many supers or frames as needed uh, as the colony is growing. For instance, if you have a weaker hive or even a stronger colony, excuse me, um, if you add too many frames or uh, supers, then you leave unpatrolled room for these bee beetles uh, to spread. And so, uh, especially if the colony is weak, the bees won't be able to patrol the beetles and they'll be able to reproduce uh, uncontrolled. So transitioning to the treatment aspect uh, for these beetles, the chemical agents too, uh, by far that are most popular are check mite strips, which are also used for a varroa. They have 10% active comophos inside them, and then Guard Star, which has a 40% permethrin concentration. So comophos is applied as a strip inside the hive, and the uh, beetles die um, when they come in direct contact with this strip or through trophallaxis in the hive, or um, and just this chemical spreading. So it kills the adult. So it's applied in stages one and two of the life cycle here. And then permethrin is applied during stage five, the pupation in the soil. Um, this is when the beetles pupate and then that soil drench kills all of them in the vicinity of the hive. Moving to the non-chemical or organic biological agents, um, the we can begin with the um, attraction-based compounds, which are these traps. So these traps are filled about halfway with attractant solution and the odor inside of them actually lures the beetle from inside the hive into those traps where they die. This is a baseboard trap. Uh, the beetles fall inside this and then also die in the oil. And then we have diatomaceous earth here. Uh, this is placed in the vicinity of the hive and this dries out the cuticle uh, of the pupae, eventually killing them. Uh, this image here on the right is of a nematode so this falls under a class of uh, entomopathogenic nematodes. So it's an insect um, that kills other insects. In this case, it's killing the, uh, the small hive beetle. And there's many different strains of these that exist out there, but um, they target the pupil stage again in, when the beetle is in the soil and then enter the beetles uh, through an orifice, either the mouth or the anus, and then make their way to the gut where they kill the beetle from the inside as a parasite. So moving to the advantages and disadvantages of chemicals, the advantages of using chemicals is that they are highly effective and have fast results, but there are many drawbacks. The first is that they are very unaffordable, especially on a large scale. They also pose a large risk of soil, water, and also uh, environmental contamination and contamination of hive products, whether it be propolis or wax or royal jelly or comb and honey. Many studies have documented this and shown the high residues that these treatments cause inside of these hive products, and not to mention the health risks that are associated with using these chemicals, not only to the bees themselves. Uh, studies have shown that these chemicals cause impaired olfactory learning and memory formation in bees and also uh, decrease their overall immunity, but they also have effects in other organisms, including humans.
So the organic treatment solutions, however, are affordable and sustainable. Um, and what I developed is actually a very effective small hive beetle agent, which is organic based. I'll be sharing that. Um, this organic treatment is environmentally friendly, naturally biodegradable, and has no risks to any organisms. So my research can be broken down um, into two key phases, and I'll also be sharing a, th a third phase. Um, each of these is like one year worth of research. So uh, year one was testing seven organic, odorous, and inexpensive small hive beetle treatments. And this, the second phase was developing a novel treatment based on beer. And beer was found to be the most effective small hive beetle attractant from these phase one trials. Uh, phase three here, uh, essentially tested the the novel treatment that blend based on beer against comophos, the leading chemical of the industry in a neck and neck trial. So year one was examining seven organic agents. These included apple cider vinegar, mango and cantaloupe puree with boric acid as a lethal agent, yeast, peanut oil, grapeseed oil, and also beer. They were placed inside these in-hive traps about halfway, uh, and the beetles die directly when they come in contact with the solution, they drown. So these specific agents, you may be wondering why were they chosen, uh, is because of prior hypotheses in the literature that had shown that these beetles can fundamentally feed and reproduce on odorous compounds. And so I tested these agents in large scale field trials uh, over multiple weeks with dozens of hives. And I found that beer was by far the best treatment for small hive beetle capture. Um, this image of me here in the middle is of uh, me counting beetles in my mother's kitchen. So this was 2020 during the pandemic, and she wasn't all that fond of this idea. Um, we'd have beetles sometimes getting loose in the household. Uh, I remember my brother and I would have fishnets in hand trying to catch those loose beetles. Uh, this image here on the left is of me in a beekeeping suit, and I have my gloves, I had smoker, I had my cap on, and you may be thinking, what a responsible young beekeeper. Well, no, that's completely incorrect. Uh, in fact, one time I forgot my boots at home, and I was stuck in the field with flip-flops and duct tape. So I duct taped my feet and then I worked in the field uh, with duct tape on my feet. So that was a very embarrassing experience for me. Now, I ran an extensive statistical analysis with the data. Um, this first test was comparing apple cider vinegar, which is the organic standard against each of the treatments. And I found that the mango, cantaloupe, yeast, and beer uh, were significantly better than the apple cider. The peanut oil, grapeseed, and the blank trap uh, did not capture more beetles than the apple cider. Now, uh, I ran further statistical analyses to see uh, what exactly the conclusion was from the data. And ultimately, what I found uh, was that beer was the best treatment. So this is a Pareto chart. We can visualize the raw beetle capture in bars for each of the treatments here. We see that the beer in deep blue has a capture of 198 compared to apple cider, which is merely 11. Oh, wow. So uh, this box and whisker plot also shows beer here in deep blue. Uh, this is the X, which is the mean amount of beetle captured. And then um, we see this compared to apple cider, again, this X. So you can see the X for beer is much higher than any of the other Xs in the study, meaning the consistency of the beetle capture for beer was much higher. So ultimately, beer was found to be 33 times more effective in its beetle capture than apple cider vinegar. And it was the best treatment by large margin. Beer costs merely five cents per hive on average, and it's also widely and readily available. In addition, it doesn't harm the bees and uh, only the beetles. So I can assure you that while using this trap inside the hive, you're not gonna end up with any drunk bees. <laughs> now, um, we can look at the cost comparison here. Uh, if you didn't believe me on that, this is an image from walmart.com. Um, the Miller High Life beer that was used in the study is merely 7.3 cents per fluid ounce, whereas apple cider vinegar is about 20 cents. So Miller High Life is not only 33 times more effective, it's also a third of the cost. So that's a really big statement. Now, the second year was looking at developing a blend based on beer's actual chemical composition. So looking at the specific chemicals that compose the beer and then uh composing a concentrated solution, essentially a refinement, like a super beer, beer on steroids. And the goal was to create a cheaper and even more effective treatment than beer itself. And so um, 
I went about doing this through chemical analyses. Um, this was done uh, in collaboration with the USDA. And so uh, these chemicals were uh, extracted, then analyzed, and then readings were produced. And then uh, these were also analyzed with some bioinformatic criteria. And uh, based on those criteria, specific volatiles were selected. Those chemicals were tested in the lab. And so uh, this test you see here on the left is olfactory, or it's EAG, uh, electroantenography. And this is basically where I could see the antennal response of the beetle, uh, the specific neurophysiological antennal response, and see how the beetle antenna is actually responding to specific compounds it's exposed to. So it's a very cool procedure. And um, it's at first very tricky because I had to excise these antenna under the microscope. And as I mentioned, these are four to six millimeters in length, very oh. tiny. It's like neurosurgery, but on small hive beetles. And so eventually after these uh, extensive laboratory assays, um, the blends were developed and then tested in the field. And so there were two blends that were developed, an oil-based beer blend and a water-based beer blend. And what I found through extensive statistical analyses um, and large-scale field trials uh, with over 28 bee colonies at over three sites for eight weeks was that the water or the oil-based beer blend was uh, much more effective than all the other treatments. The oil-based beer blend um, had a total capture of 620 beetles throughout the course of the study, whereas the beer was 125. So it was five times more effective than beer and also two times cheaper. So both research goals were accomplished. And then the third year was a comparison of this beer-based blend against the leading and only EPA-approved chemical of the industry, Comophos. And so this was a neck-and-neck -neck field trial to compare their efficacies in the field setting. So if you're not familiar with comophos, this is what the strip looks like. It's cut in half and then uh, stapled to cardboard as per the label. And the organic agents were placed inside these beetle blaster traps. So the issue that I ran into uh, when composing this study design was that this comophos doesn't actually have any... Um, there's no way for you to quantify how many beetles are actually killed by it. Whenever the beetles come in contact with this strip, they don't die immediately. They can exit the hive through the top or the bottom or die anywhere inside the hive. There's no sticky mechanism or anything of that sort. So contrary to that, with these traps, you can actually quantify the number of beetles inside the trap by just counting it. And so to actually compare their efficacies, I couldn't just put the chemical in one hive and put the organic agent in another. I wouldn't know how the chemical is performing. So uh, it was a comparative field trial in that there were two clusters, an organic cluster, which had only organic treatments inside of it, and then an organic plus chemical cluster, which had the organic agents inside all the hives, but also comophos at the same time. So this way, we could see how the presence of the comophos was affecting the capture of the organic treatments. And this was the only sound way to really test this hypothesis. And ultimately, the conclusion was that the blend and comophos did not have um, they, they had similar efficacy statistically. So I did a lot of statistics on the back end um, to quantify this. And not only is the blend just as effective as Comophos, but it's 80 times cheaper per hive. So a big, big economic implication. This blend is currently sitting um, at about 8 cents per hive. And so unfortunately, that blend um, isn't available commercially as of yet. Um, but... In regards to how you can use this finding uh, and how, beer is still extremely effective for a hive beetle capture, and it doesn't harm your bees in any way. Again, no drunk bees, I can guarantee it, unless your entire hive somehow flips. And uh, beer can be used as an in-hive trap um, or as an in-hive attractant for any trap. It doesn't necessarily have to be those beetle blaster traps that I was showing. It's extremely cost effective as well. And so the key takeaways are really um, to have good apiary practices, maintain cleanliness inside the hive, and have good sunlight exposure. Um, and those other things that I mentioned with only adding as many frames as needed for the hive, uh, not exposing the hive to any dilapidated frames or combs. 
and also using treatments to control for these infestations, whether that ultimately be chemical or organic based methods um, up to you. So it's really the synergy of these two things that reduces these beetle populations to a low and manageable level. There's no silver bullet strategy um, for treating these pests. They're never really gonna go away. You can only um, reduce their populations. So having good apiary practices and using treatments. Um, these are some resources for small hive beetle management. I can definitely share these uh, with Miss Mickey uh, to circulate amongst you all if you'd like to take a look. Uh, the first two are two PDFs, uh, which are informative about the hive beetle and also some treatment. And then the last is the UF Honeybee Lab page. Um, this has some helpful videos, not only on hive beetle control, uh, but also on other uh, beekeeping tips. Um, before I conclude, I just want to share, um, I re just recently, a few months ago, published a children's book um, called The Bee Story. And so this has illustrations, graphics, and is extremely kid-friendly. Um, it's aimed at elementary and middle school students. Um, if you're interested, um, I would really appreciate the support. Uh, the, support. the QR code is uh, here if you'd like to scan it with your phone uh, or take a look later. I'll leave that up for a second. It's uh, available on Amazon. And uh, once again, that's called The Bee Story. It's on Amazon. And um, that's all I have for you all tonight. Um, I do have this other QR code, which is uh, a short two-minute survey just on what you thought about my speaking. Uh, I'll also leave this up here, but I'm open to questions now. Uh, thank you all so much. Go ahead. Uh, Atria, can you hear her? Did yes, I, I can. Um, for your um, agents and your control, did you test just oil with no beer as one of the methods to control the small hive beetle? Yes. So um, the oil was actually tested. The oil was tested in that second year. Um, that's what this control is. So this is the uh, the oil by itself. What kind of oil? That was my question. This is mineral oil. Really? Just straight up mineral oil? Yeah, vegetable oil yeah. and mineral oil. Oh, okay. Cool. And the base for this oil blend is actually um, soybean oil. So it's a vegetable oil. So a tray on a similar note, uh, I'm curious as to why Miller Highlight was used. <laughs> and I, I say that partially jokingly, but also from a, a serious standpoint, I, I wonder why why that beer in particular was chosen, that style of beer, that ABV beer, what could be some possible thoughts on using a different style of beer with different ABVs? And I think it's a really cool implication and in finding that it's pulling in more beetles. I've always used apple cider vinegar myself, and, but I'm, I'm a little hesitant to use beer just because, frankly, the thought of really hot beer makes me kind of gag. So I don't really want to open my hive and have traps with beer that's been sitting there for however long in a 98 degree environment. So I was curious if that had any, if it, you know, what happens to the beer over time, if it maybe loses some of its efficacy over time. But I know that's sort of a rambling series of questions. Above all else, I just want to know why you chose Miller Highlight, I guess. <laughs> Right. Uh, no, that's a great question. So um, at first, Miller High Life was used in the study because uh, it was inexpensive and readily available. Um, now, the the second part of your question in regards to how you could use different types of beers, um, my brother is actually uh, also interested in this, and he ran a beer comparison study this year as a follow-up to this. And what he found was that as you increase the alcohol concentration, the attraction increases. So this is actually based, <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is based, I'm pretty sure this is based on, um, as I mentioned earlier with that, with that yeast. Let's go back. Okay, so as I mentioned with that yeast, this yeast ferments the pollen and the honey. And so this produces that uh, that pheromone isoamyl alcohol. So similar to that process of fermentation, beer is produced through alcohol fermentation. And so what we may be seeing is that this beer is essentially mimicking that isoamyl alcohol because isoamyl alcohol is attractive to the beetles themselves. 
Now, if you put straight up isoamyl alcohol into the colony, you're just going to get very angry bees. Um, so this may be mimicking that and it may be similar to it uh, without necessarily angering the bees. So was there any um, comparison between types of beer, not just amount of alcohol? Yes, uh, there was. So I, I don't know the exact specifics of this study, um, but I do know that there were varying alcohol concentrations. It's also different flavors of the beer. Uh, but the main, I think the main correlation was that as the alcohol is increasing, the beetle capture was also increasing. Okay. I would, I would think the amount of malt would also attract. That's why was, malt would yeah. be more. But is the smell of the beer attracting more beetles? Right. Not necessarily a higher kill rate, right. but if that slime out, that yeah. chemical attracts beetles, more beetles to your hive, is that why you're seeing more beetles dying? Because there are simply more of them in the hive than there would have been <laughs> without the smelly fermentation of the rotting beer. I don't know. Right. So um, if I, okay, so whenever these beetles enter the trap, uh, they drown immediately. So the attract, like the attractiveness to the mortality rate is pretty much one for one. As these beetles enter the trap, they just, they fall in the solution. Um, so it's very effective in that manner. Um, now, the second part of your question, do you mind, I didn't exactly catch that. Was it a question? Yeah. If you're adding an attractant, a small hive beetle attractant to the hive, are you actually increasing the number of beetles who would show up anyway? Okay, I understand. So, uh, no. Generally, this, this thing, uh, these attractants are not strong enough to lure beetles from outside the colony into the colony. Uh, this functions as an in-hive treatment. So, you have beetles that are already inside the hive um, and uh, coming into that trap. And it may even be that... Um, like if, if there are many supers on top of the hive, it may even be that the odor of this compound isn't strong enough to reach the bottom of the colony. It may just be like a few supers, maybe one up and one down. Um, and the beetles that are near that are actually picking that up um, because, because of all the other factors, the smell of the pollen and the honey inside the hive, the wind. So there's no way to actually test that. I'm just hypothesizing here. But what I was seeing generally throughout the course of all these three years uh, is ex as experimenting with these attractants, um, when you're placing them inside of the colony and testing this through large-scale field trials, the overall correlation I was seeing is that beer was highly effective. And I also ran controlled studies in the lab to uh, confirm this. Um, I didn't share this, but one of these studies that I ran in this um, second year was something called olfactometry. And so olfactometry is essentially a choice response. So you can put four different odors and then have the beetles in a central chamber and see which chambers they migrate to. And notably, what I found was uh, for one of the bioassays, um, 10 replicates were performed with 10 beetles in each replicate. And of those 100 beetles, 94 of them were captured by the blend. And that's not due to chance. So um, the blend was in that assay. The beer was in that assay. There was oil and then also a blank. So there was a 94% success rate with that. This is Cecilia. I have a question. Uh, what proportion do you use of beer and oil? Is it one third to two thirds? What is the proportion you put in a beetle trap? Mm -hmm. So um, this this blend itself isn't uh, just beer mixed with oil. It's very specific compounds from the beer um, that were handpicked and then concentrated. So as you may know, beer is composed of like 90 to 95% water. So it's very diluted. And the goal with this is to uh, was to concentrate it in the form of a blend. So um, it wasn't just beer and then oil together. It was specific compounds from the beer mixed with some oil. Um, and you could experiment with just adding beer and oil. Uh, it could be maybe two thirds beer and then one third oil, because as you do add the oil, it will mask the odor. Um, maybe if it's half and half, that would mask it more as you increase the amount of oil. Uh, but you could play around with that. I haven't done much experimenting with that. Thank you. I'm just figuring out how we can use it because we don't have the equipment to concentrate beer. <laughs> we'll just start with beer. Another highlight of the same kind of beer. Beers. I think we could just yeah, start with beer. We, I mean, we could, we could even run an experiment on our own using 
an emulsifier of some kind to get the beer and the oil blend to mix because you're right, the, the water and the, that's going to prevent that from happening. But just plain old beer, that's that's pretty straightforward. Now I'm right. wondering about carbonation because lager is a higher carbonation than something like stout. Putting a stout on a hive, yeah, that, that, that's, that's pretty gross. Besides being that, a waste of beer, that, that's a waste of beer. Yeah. <laughs> I'll make put a Guinness in there, but we call it the. That's <laughs> what's the traps look like that they're using? Is it just a mat with a it's mm -hmm. soaked with a no, fluid? No, no, no. 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 You fill it. Yeah, they they use it. They're using a capsule, the normal beetle, beetle trap. That's yeah. putting beer in it instead of something else or nothing. And it's set at the bottom of the hive. It goes between the frames. Goes in between the frames. Right. If you go up to Day Nant and you ask for a small hive to fill trap in hive, it's, it's like a little plastic canoe with a top on, um, with a black top, and it has holes so the beetle can get in, but the bee can't. So, yeah, ask for beetle so that, blasters. That beetle blasters. That beetle blasters is the Yes, problem. that's exactly what's on the screen. Um, you have the solution about halfway inside of it. You have these grids at the top, and the beetles can enter, but the beetles, uh, the beetles can enter, but the bees cannot. Right. That's how this looks on the so bottom right. Showing that when you bait them, it's better than leaving them empty. So, because you can't just leave them empty and some hives will push the beetle in there and trap them like they do in the kind of corners, mm -hmm. but it's way more efficacious to have bait of some sort. Exactly. So, uh, the beetles can also crawl out. So the material inside these isn't like anti-slip, so they can easily crawl out. And that, that has happened before, especially in those empty traps. Oh, okay. uh, assuming we don't have the chemistry to make your blend uh something as simple as just letting the carbonation bubble out of the beer before you mix it did you have any you know obviously it's really foamy very for it in there so foam out but just degas it basically uh sorry i didn't hear the second half of the question do you guess the beer before you put it? You... Does, it does the amount of carbonation matter? Should you let the car, should you let the beer go flat before you put it in? Um, in my experiments, I was not using flat beer. Uh, it was straight out of the can. Um, I'm not sure how the carbonation would affect the the odor. It may intensify it. Um, but the beer would have been a very short period of time in a warm environment. <laughs> Anyway. Yeah, and the other thing in regards to that is, apart from the carbonation, you have evaporation. So it's there's so much of a water base inside of it. If you're using this in the summer, um, you may want to add a little bit of oil just to prevent some of that evaporation. Oh, that's interesting. Eric, can you remind us, or at least remind me anyway, how long you had a trap when you're doing the initial trials with just the beer? How long the traps mm -hmm. were in the hives for? Right. So the first year was using um, just a week. So it was a week in and then replacement after that week. The second year was using uh, two weeks. And so uh, there wasn't much of a difference in the capture. Uh, so probably using this for two to four weeks would be a sweet spot, uh, okay. depending on how many beetles you have inside that hive. Because obviously, as you have more beetles in the hive, the trap will fill up quicker. And the more beetles you have inside of that trap, you also have to think about um, the decomposition of the beetles that actually that's like repulsive to other beetles. So it'll decrease the attractiveness of the actual beer inside the trap. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. I wouldn't want to go into a hole if I could smell like rotting right. corpses or something. I'd be like, I'm not going to go in there. But well, no matter how much beer is in there, but it's interesting. The one time that I had a super infestation small hive beetle in, in a hive. And even though the hive was kind of small, they were managing to keep them all down at one end. But literally, I could pick them up in the hand. It was very strange. And when I crushed them, they actually smelled sweet. Yeah. So anyway, there so you go. Looked, that <laughs> looks something like this. Yeah, but wait, I mean, it was, yeah. <laughs> there was literally, it, it was, what, what was the, the hurricane in that round Turkey Creek scene? Irma? Or, um, was it Irma? Yeah, it, it had to do with hurricanes, and so all kinds of bad things happened at that time. Mm -hmm. So what are your plans next, Atreya? Where are you going next with this? 
Um, the next step for this is actually to uh, create a, a potential pre-filled trap um, and have some electronics in the trap to okay. analyze the numbers. That would be interesting. Pre-fill or a concentration that someone could add water or something like that too and use that as a trap or use that as your, your base. That would be interesting too. Exactly, yeah. So something of that nature, which makes it a lot easier, especially on a commercial scale. Right, right. It'll be interesting to see once you commercialize it, if you can still keep it as cheap as it is. Right. <laughs> but even if it's cheaper than Kumapos and obviously so much less damaging, it's it's the contribution is still so solid. Right, right. And the other thing is there's a wide array of benefits to using this. You don't have any risk of resistance. Uh, unlike these chemicals, putting them in the hive, through generations of reproduction, the beetles are going to become resistant to it. And reports have already come out, uh, especially in Florida, where this is a big problem. Oh. There was a paper in 2019 about uh, documenting their resistance. And that was from Florida, actually. Two yes, two comophobes. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And so that's a problem. You don't have a problem with resistance to this because they're just falling in and dying. They're not going to reproduce. This is inhibiting their reproduction. So that's one thing. And other things with the treatment cycles. So this isn't going to uh, leach into the hive. Uh, you may be thinking, well, it's volatile. What if it gets into the hive products? The first thing is that the four compounds used to compose this fall under the class of GRAS or generally recognized as safe. So they're commonly used in food and beverage manufacturing. Uh, so they don't pose a high risk and they're present at very low concentrations inside of the blend itself. Uh, so they don't have any contamination risks, unlike the chemicals, which a lot of studies have shown high risk of residues with. Um, it's also a lot cheaper. Comifo sits at about uh, $6 per hive, whereas this thing is sitting about eight hives or eight cents per hive. Sorry. So it's okay. much, much cheaper. All right. Any other questions? Hi, Dan. Oh. Did you sneak in from? No. A 7 <laughs> So, Atreya, I know you can't see all of us, but there's actually like 15 people here. So, <laughs> it's just where the camera is in this room, it's one of the automated systems that was put in like during COVID. And it, it, it's made for someone to sit up front and to do a hybrid kinds of lessons. So, you're seeing just the back of a couple of people, but we're all here. <laughs> all right. Any other? Atreya? When you go into phase three, could we be part of the beta process with that? <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I'd love that. Uh, that would be amazing. Uh, if you want to, I have my email um, on the slide, or if you'd like to share your email in the chat, um, I'd love to keep in touch <laughs> regarding beta testing. Yeah, we, we'll share your email around. Well, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> if that's all right with you, I guess. Oh, of course. It's on the slide here. Oh, yeah, oh that's, a good, that's a good point. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. You must be finishing up your semester. Are you done yet? Um, I'm done. I'm on summer break now. So I start 11th grade in August. I'm glad that you're done for the summer and that we are not totally like in your cram time as you're trying to finish up the semester. <laughs> but thank you so, so very much for, for meeting with us tonight. Um, and we look forward to phase three and to what whatever it is that your brother is doing as well. <laughs> Maybe we'll see you in B College next year. Absolutely. It was so nice uh, speaking with you all. I had a lot of fun. <laughs> all right. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.